total disorganization of our life. We have to order now. Yes. At least we have that now. map 
of the number of convicted felons in each county uh, it, prior to the 2018 election. And the map on the right was supposed to be similarly colored in the same scheme, and you would see that the, and that is of those who are actually removed from the rolls because they are felons. And what is interesting is I actually will point this out, the only blue county is over here on the right. So one would think, okay, if there are lots of felons in the dark blue counties, which are the most felons, and the very light colored are, have the least number of felons, you would think that the, the counties with the most amount of felons would actually have the most number of felons removed from the rolls. But the map doesn't show that. But of course, if you're an empiricist, you think, okay, well, there are lots of explanations for why that would be. Felons might not be initially registered. You know, there are partisan considerations. There are geographical considerations, demographic considerations. So if you activate a few quick models, which I did, which would not be up to the standards of political science publication, but if you account for county level variation, demographic characteristics, partisanship, uh, all these different things, the only thing that can statistically and substantively correlates with whether felons are removed from the rolls or not are the administrative structure of that county. The rules that the county uses when it comes to keeping lists, where they get their information, do they get their information from the state or from the county level, this is the stuff that matters. Yet very few people talk about that. And so that's kind of what prompted me to think about this stuff a little bit more. And um, oh. so what I would propose is that we really don't spend enough time thinking about the administration of disenfranchisement and restoration policies. And today, obviously, I'm going to focus on the restoration policies. Now, there is an inherent legal recognition of discretion in election administration. So, the U.S. Constitution places most of election administration in the hands of the states. And while there are a few constraints, particularly when it comes to congressional control of congressional and presidential elections, and some incentives, for example, grants for adopting certain standards, most administration occurs at the state level. And as I say the state level, in reality, it's often the local level or the county level, as, as was discussed and suggested by the Florida example. So according to some research, at least 7,000 different units of local government administer elections under authority delegated to them by the state legislatures. Yet we really don't spend that much time looking at the statutes that actually delegate that authority. Um, and what is interesting is, as we're talking about federal constraints and incentives, for example, uh, HAVA, uh, I was thinking, as Rogers was talking about the partisan uh, project of all of this, um, HAVA also created the election assistance, or what? EAC. EAC. Why can't I? Yeah. Anyway, the EAC. And what is interesting about that creation is, on its face, it looks nonpartisan. So the EAC, if you study administrative law, you would think of it as a classic independent commission. It has a multi-member board. It's uh, board members serve fixed terms. Uh, there are party balancing requirements. So you look at the structure and you say, oh, well, that makes sense. We want the administration, the assistance of uh, registration and things like that to be a nonpartisan thing. And indeed, on its face, <coughs> the EAC looks very insulated. However, if you look at the statute, it is actually one of the most political when it comes to review of their policies. So politicians have a ton of review and influence over the EAC. And um, it's actually on par with Citizens and Immigration Services, uh, Customs and Border Control, and FEMA, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, and so that's the federal level. <coughs> funding, standards, information dissemination, and obviously how uh, felons are treated. 
So just to give you an example of the variation that we're talking about with respect to administration, I thought I would use the Florida example and then add in Rhode Island. Now I know Alex is going to talk about New York, and so I was going to try to incorporate New York into this, but I started reading New York election law when I told him this, and I lost my mind. <laughs> I read statutes, regulations, executive orders, even parole officer manuals to try to figure out what the heck was going on, and my whole career has been based off of reading the law and figuring out what agency structure looks like. And I couldn't do it. <laughs> and it's like, if I can't do it, I'm quite certain there are probably other people who can't do it either. Uh, so let's look at Florida. So this is as of two days ago. Now, it might have changed. But uh, this is the current bill that is in the Rules Committee right now. And so there is a bill saying, OK, how do we deal with rights restoration? So there's an application, which actually there's been a development uh, in terms of the historical development of that legislation. But right now, there's a restoration application that you need to fill out. Not much detail about what that will be, how we will go about accepting those applications, processing those, things, those applications. Not very much detail about that. And then the Department of Corrections shall inform and educate inmates and offenders about their rights restoration. What does that mean? No idea. The amount of discretion in that law is crazy. Now, contrast that with Rhode Island, which this is their current statute. You have automatic restoration, um, and then the Department of Corrections actually has to notify uh, every felon in that their voting rights are restored, provide them with a registration card and a declination card, and transmit the completed form, whichever they decide to, uh, to fill out, to the election board. In addition, the Secretary of State has to develop and implement programs to educate administrators to ensure that they're prepared to provide this sort of information to inmates. This is crazy difference. And we don't really talk about this stuff that much, as far as I can see. So these sorts of examples really suggest that administration is key. And so this is where my research comes in. Uh, and I was thinking back to Mirna's point about de facto disenfranchisement. And this is, this is, this is where this plays in. And so I would suggest that political science and public administration actually offer a theoretical insight uh, that can help explain <coughs> variation in right, rights restoration. So just to give you a preview of what I'm going to argue, uh, the administrative burden affects how successful states are at restoring uh, voting rights to felons. And in particular, how much discretion a state legislature gives to various administrators actually affects the challenges to restoring rights to felons. And so I'll highlight three underappreciated aspects of state administration um, and suggest that we really need to ask, who are the administrators? What is the organizational structure in which these administrators operate? And as a result, what are the incentives that these administrators face? And so I'll define administrative burden, uh, which is an individual's experience with policy implementation. So put another way, it's an individual's experience uh, in their interactions with the state. And the idea of administrative burden has been a constant in this country's uh, voting rights history. So as was discussed on the last panel, historically, decisions such as literacy tests, voter ID laws, and voter registration forms have been used to influence access to the ballot. And so administrative burden is actually a venue for politics. And the literature suggests that there are three costs that may increase the difficulty that citizens have in accessing public services, including the ability to get their rights restored. And the first is learning. And so this is the processes that you have to go through to collect information about public services and how they're relevant to you. And administrators can increase this by not responding to information requests, providing or not information, or even simply being rude 
We've all had experiences at the DMV with someone who is disgruntled about their job, and it makes you not want to go, right? But you have to. Um, the second is psychological, and this is the stigma associated with a particular program and the sense of a loss of power or autonomy as you interact with the state. Again, the DMV is a great example. I feel like I have no autonomy when it comes to dealing with anyone who works at the DMV. Although I will say Missouri contracts out, and I have found them to be the best of all the states that I live in. Whether there's a correlation there is another whole set of issues. But um, the importance and the, you know, there's a stress of dealing with the bureaucracy, which everyone talks about, red, state, or red tape, et cetera. And that's really important. Because even if an individual chooses to participate, chooses to try to get their rights restored, um, administrative practice can actually reinforce any stigma associated with a criminal conviction. And as this interaction experience becomes more degrading or intrusive, as has been documented by some of the scholars who, who came before me, um, it erodes this basic need for autonomy. And I think this ties to, like I said, a lot of people's work who, who, who uh, talked already. Um, and then the third is compliance. And these are the burdens of just following administrative rules and requirements. So I know what the administrative rules are. I have already overcome any psychological barriers that I have to adhering to these rules. OK, now how do I do it? How much effort do I have to exert in order to adhere to these rules? And we actually, in political science and public administration, have the strongest empirical evidence on this. So paperwork, difficulty um, in taking the time, face-to-face -face interactions versus sort of having, getting to mail in a registration document, these things all decrease uh, participation. And what's really important to notice is that these costs are not stable. They're a function of policymakers and street level bureaucrats uh, decision making processes. And so the discretion that administrators have actually allow for this increase or decrease of administrative <coughs> burden on any of the three costs. And so the policy preferences of all political actors, elected officials, political appointees, managers, street level bureaucrats, will all influence the balance of the burden between the individual and the state. In addition, it's also worth noting that the administrative burden is an attractive policy tool precisely because it's so opaque. So this came up in a couple of people's, uh, people's comments. I know uh, Jack, wherever, oh, right here, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I know Jack sort of hinted at this, and, and Pam Carlin uh, hinted at this too. And it's, you can look like you're actually doing one thing, but if you structure the administrative state in another way, nobody really pays attention to that. And what's even more interesting is when you start thinking about the role of the courts in all of this. Because as courts have been more reticent to get involved in, in felony disenfranchisement cases, if we start talking about administrative discretion, things become even more complicated because of discretion doctrines in judicial review. So thoughts moving forward, uh, I just pulled a quote from the supervisor of elections in Okaloosa County in Florida. And he said, clearly there are things that we do not know and things that we cannot know, know until someone provides us <laughs> with better definitions. And whether it goes, it gets done by legislation, whether it gets done by administrative rule, or whether it gets done by the court, at some point, Somebody's got to clarify the process. And this is an administrator saying, I have no idea what to do. And so first, let's understand who these administrators are. And so these are just some of the things that you could think about when it comes to this. Who's making the policy? Is it elected officials? Is it the courts? Is it administrators? What are their qualifications? What are their level of experience? Are they representative in terms of the representative bureaucracy literature? All of these things matter when we start thinking about this stuff. What is the role of elected versus career appointees in this process when we talk about creating standards that can be administered across the state? 
how many agencies or political actors involved. So there are some states that actually involve the Secretary of State, the Board of Parole, the Board of, uh, or the Division of Corrections. You might get like three or four different agencies all having a say in rights restoration. And that's not even considering registration and all of that stuff. That creates a multiple principle problem, which is one of my things that I like to study. <laughs> uh, and then finally, there's, with respect to understanding the administrators, we have to think about the capacity of the administrators to handle this task. And I'm not talking about whether they are skilled enough to do their job, but like, even if they are skilled enough, how much is on their plate? Inevitably, administrators have to balance lots of things because they have limited resources. What are they going to prioritize and what are they not? Uh, second, we have to think about the work environment in which these administrators operate. So how centralized are procedures and training? If I'm supposed to tell people on parole that they have their rights restored, how am I, how am I trained to tell those individuals? Is it just something I'm told once? Is there an employee manual? We don't know anything about any of this stuff, as far as I can tell. Um, are there performance reviews? Does someone actually follow up to see <coughs> if information is being disseminated? And who re regulates these aspects of the job? And then finally, once you understand these two things, then you can start talking about the incentive structure. <coughs> so the specificity in statute and regulation and how that affects various actors' incentives, and uh, whether there's regular auditing and oversight, either by the legislature or the governor, uh, these are all things that matter and we really don't know that much about. Uh, so in summary, most of my research looks at administrative structure and argues that in order to understand how our government works or how it, in order to understand governance, period, we need to understand what, what the administrative state looks like. So before we can start talking about proposals for reform and things like that, we really, really need to understand the rules of the game. And I think in this particular area, we do not do as good of a job understanding the rules of the game. So with that, I will leave it to you all. Um, thank you, Jen. That was really helpful. And I, I love the multiple Asian, multiple principle problem. Problem language. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and for inviting me. Um, I mentioned Caroline as well, I don't know if she's still here, but uh, for the Herculean work of actually figuring out how to fix a broken runway. Um, I also, for me personally, I owe real professional debts to a number of people here for helping me out over the years and just really shaping the way I think about a lot of this stuff. So it really means a lot for me to be here. Um, uh, Eugene Debs and George Steinbrenner is the place for us to start. Um, Steinbrenner, of course, if you grew up a Red Sox fan back in the day when we always used to lose to them, um, he was the head of the evil empire, so I was really glad when I learned that he was a convicted felon. Um, and by the way, I have a, I know I'm sort of making fun of Steinbrenner here, but um, um, Mirna had to leave, but she did talk about um, person first language. And um, I'm a bi really big believer, that, and there's, by the way, there's a great article by Denver, Bushway, I'm forgetting their, their third co-author. I can give you the site if you want. But person first language is people with disabilities instead of the disabled, et cetera. And people with felony convictions, or people with backgrounds, or returning citizens, as Washington, D.C. administrators call them. Um, that stuff matters. And there's a great article by Denver and Bushway show um, that, well, I get into the details, but they actually sort of do some really cool experiments posing little vignettes for people and saying, like, would you hire this person? And the only thing that was different was that they were referred to as violent felon or a person convicted of a violent crime. And they were also asked, how likely do you think this person is to reoffend? And again, all they changed was that language and found meaningful differences between how people predicted the future dangerousness and the employability of the person just based on the substitution of person first language. So it really matters to use that language. Um, it's a little bit tricky in doing this kind of research because so many people that you talk to in government will just use the term felon, and so many statutes will use that term as well. So it's a little, so I'm gonna be doing some sort of moving back and forth. And so there's kind of a meta joke going on, like if you and me and we call Steinbrenner a felon, that's like a joke about a joke kind of thing. So anyway, so Steinbrenner got a felony conviction for a, it's even better if you hate him, 
um, or the Yankees, but for a Watergate uh, creep uh, campaign finance uh, violation. Um, he was a full-on you know, Watergate campaign finance um, offender. And he said many years later to an, to an interviewer, um, I missed the right to vote until President Reagan, bless his soul, gave me a pardon. It was very tough for me. I'm very patriotic. But if Steinbrenner had made New York his voting domicile, he would not have been disenfranchised um, while he was on probation or thereafter. Um, he lived in Florida for most of his life, and that's probably what he's talking about here. But in Florida, too, he could have gone through the discretionary um, vote process, became infamous years later. But so Steinbrenner either, and there's other reasons to want a pardon, presumably he wanted a pardon for sort of deeper reasons as well. But had Steinbrenner really just wanted to vote, he might not have really understood the options um, available to him there. Debs, this is extraordinary. Um, I, and this is, you know, unapologetically, this is me sort of chasing random things that Jill LaFleur mentions in her New Yorker articles. Uh -huh. So here's one of the last letters that Eugene Debs wrote to the judge who had convicted him of so like basically seditious libel. And he got like seven million votes for president while he was in prison. Um, uh, dear judge, it's, I have to read you some of this because it's like sort of the whole point. Um, upon my release from prison, I was given to understand from various sources that seemed authoritative that my citizenship had been forfeited or at least impaired to an extent that I was deprived of the right to vote. And consequently, I have not since attempted the exercise of the elective franchise. Quite recently, however, a lawyer of high standing, after a thorough investigation, expressed the opinion that I had never been disfranchised by reason of my conviction in your court, that you had made no pronouncement to that effect, etc. Um, meanwhile, Congress has taken up the question, and when the matter was brought to Congress, the administrative leaders in both branches declared my citizenship had never been forfeited, and so Debs wrote to the judge, so what's up? What's the deal? And the judge writes back this amazing letter. Um, the whole, there's this like 500 word first paragraph that's like, I can't offer you a legal opinion. Here comes my legal opinion. Um, and he's, he goes on to basically refer before Trophy Dulles to sort of Trophy Dulles' result. Um, but maybe you can guess what the answer to his, because the judge gives this answer. Um, if your counsel like agrees with me in this foregoing stuff, then the answer to the inquiries propounded in your letter must be found in the Constitution and laws of the state of Indiana. Uh, of which you are a citizen and resident. I am not familiar with those laws and they are not now accessible to me. For purpose of illustration, however, let me talk about Ohio for a while since I live in Ohio. And <laughs> this place, so goes on. These suggestions will indicate to you and your counsel that the questions propounded in your letter are much complicated and depend upon a great variety of constitutions, statutes, and conditions. So George Steinbrenner and Eugene Debs couldn't understand with the existence of counsel and the US Congress the disenfranchisement laws to which they're, they're, uh, they may or may not have been subjected. And I suggest there are a great many other Americans who have this problem, too. Um, there, there are examples of, they kind of touch, they're wildly atypical, obviously, convicts. But they kind of touch on this problem, which I don't have a great name for. We need Pam Carlin to have one of her like brilliant, sort of pithy, aphoristic sort of phrases to name this thing. But it's the restoration problem. It's a restoration information problem. Um, what I want to try to do, uh, talking as fast as I can, and resisting some tangents and following others, and reading from some documents too, I want to talk about how I see it. Like, I think there are four pieces that basically make up this problem, and then tell a few stories, because I too am sort of early in some research, um, dealing, looking into what states are doing uh, to inform people who are eligible to vote um, about their right to vote. So um, millions of people with criminal convictions are eligible to vote and don't know it. In fact, the overall majority of Americans with felony convictions are eligible to vote. Many who are still under sentence and, and many who are not under sentence any longer. Um, this is a realm of variation and discretion and complexity like other collateral consequences. It's not one in which we have a clearly defined sort of class of citizens who are, who are clearly and sort of sharply um, degraded. Um, there's a great deal of misinformation um, among this population and also among officials. So just in the course of talking to people, Rhode Island Secretary of State staffer, now that you've served your felony, you're eligible. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, here's somebody in the D.C. Board of Elections. There's so much misinformation about it. People believing they can't vote. D.C. public schools have a number of settings where students have juvenile justice system involvement. We did registration drives, and many of these kids would say, I can't register because I have a felony or I'm on probation. Um, a New York City probation official, it's news to them because a lot of them were told they can't vote. So the first part of this problem, the restoration information problem, is simply the fact that a lot of people are eligible to vote um, and think they're not. Um, the second piece of it is that nudging people to vote increases turnout in any setting. We know this from lots of studies, including one that somehow got through IRB, 
um, involving uh, outing, like shaming people. Uh, this is a green piece also, like shaming people by telling them that they will their neighbors will be told whether you voted or not. It's an amazing study, but sort of people without criminal convictions are also increased, uh, will, will be more likely to vote if we are reminded uh, of voting in, in other ways as well. Um, something um, that I was gonna talk about more and, and which Jen has already introduced here, political scientists, at least some, and economists are very comfortable talking about the cost of voting and information costs and sort of psychological costs that Jen was explaining with voting. For people with criminal convictions, for people with backgrounds, voting is far more expensive far, far more expensive in two really important ways than people without convictions. One is the information cost of determining your eligibility and registering and being sure of it are far higher. And second, the costs of voting illegally are really quite serious. We have a woman sentenced to five years in prison in Texas last year for voting unlawfully and some prosecutions in North Carolina last year as well. So the information costs are a huge sort of element of this problem as well. Third piece of this, many public officials don't know the law. Every single study, advocacy piece, I've done some research on this, Every journalistic piece that looks at it, many public officials don't know the law. I mean, Mano is making light of the fact that election officials need to know the difference between probation and parole. It's not a joke at all. Um, and then, right, she goes on to explain sort of gradations of all these different types and levels of supervision. So there's a tremendous amount of, of, um, of ignorance among, among public officials about what the rules are. Um, and, and finally, there's extreme complexity in the law. I know that's a bland sort of way to state this, but maybe I can come back to what Roger said earlier. This practice is at the intersection of these two institutions the electoral system and the criminal justice system. Those are hyper-decentralized systems in the United States with often terrible or non-existent record keeping and very little coordination. So you have a practice that in principle is at the intersection of these two practices and institutions, and these are institutions that really are very, very decentralized and that are often sort of not sort of talking to each other. And I'll read a couple of quotations about this later. And by the way, I don't know if anybody's mentioned, um, Beth Colgan, C-O-L-G-A-N, this is the must-read article that really will change how you understand disenfranchisement. And she talks about a whole bunch of things, but especially about the number of states that require you to make some kind of payment in order to have your vote restored is orders of magnitude larger than we thought it was. Because so many states, for example, to successfully complete probation, you have to pay uh, certain kinds of fees or certain fines that are associated with probation. Um, and so it's, a, it's an amazing article that covers a great deal of ground, talks about disenfranchisement as punishment, and talks about restoration uh, and uh, socioeconomic discrimination, an amazing piece. And she really shows this with uh, really on the ground sort of granular research into sort of these, some of these documentary elements. I too have an amazing Floridian quote for you from the last um, couple of months. Um, Florida, let's see, this is Byron Donald. I wholeheartedly believe voting rights should be, I might read this one twice because it's just, it gets better every time I read it. I wholeheartedly believe voting rights should be restored, said Byron Donald, a Republican state rep from Naples, who said he voted for Amendment 4. But we have to define it. It was crystal clear that nobody knew how to actually tell an offender that they have completed their sentence. So now, I don't want to impute bad faith by Mr. Donalds, but it's, this is an extremely clear example, and Jen just said this really well too, right? And uh, many other people today have referred to this, but this is sort of, you can formally restore eligibility, um, but say, well, it's unclear how we're actually going to make the determination that this person um, is, is eligible. Um, say, well, in principle, I want this person to be eligible. So I have some comments in closing about this, but it's really, I hope you can hear this, that it's preserving this premise, which we started the day with, of the vote as a privilege. It's preserving this foundational idea that there are deserving and undeserving. It's preserving this foundational premise that it's okay to make certain people prove their eligibility, prove their worth, prove their qualifications. I would like to let this person vote, but we just don't know the details as to whether they're formally by the dots of the T's of the letters of the thing. So that's the four pieces of the problem as I understand it. Misinformation among the population that's affected, uh, misinformation among elected officials, what we know about the price of voting and how expensive it is to vote um, if you're somebody with a background, and then simply the complexity that's built into the law and the sort of information problems that we've got. Um, I want to talk about one, just really fast, a few states that I've been looking into. I'm really fascinated by a particular group of states, the incarceration-only states. The incarceration-only states, the group of states that only disqualify people while they are incarcerated following a felony conviction. Um, does uh, the Department of Corrections inform people leaving supervision, you are now eligible? Do probation and parole, and why should, what, right? Do those two offices, or those, if they're in different departments in different states, which they often are, inform people under supervision, you're eligible, and sort of here's how to do it. Um, these are some big states, and some of them are purple. 
Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, some of the, right, Maryland, Michigan, New York, there's a recent change with parolees, which I'll talk about, um, Ohio and Pennsylvania. Um, and there's a couple other states that are really not in that class, but they've also made some really interesting recent sort of changes too that I want to talk about. So just a few things about these states. Okay, best practices, and Jen described this, but there's this, and, and Mirna's work uh, has done, a, a group has done a lot on this too. Making the DOC an NVRA agency. This is the kind of policy reformer language for this. The reason that the Rhode Island Department of Corrections provides that opportunity to register to people is that it's treated like the, like the DMV. If you, in your state law, you make the Department of Corrections an NVRA agency, that's the motor voter law, you're requiring that agency to provide people with an opportunity to register. So that's what happens in Rhode Island. There are two jurisdictions in the United States that have made the DOC um, an NVRA agency, um, and Rhode Island is one of them. Um, they supposedly keep those figures, they're supposed to report figures, the DOC, um, I'm waiting for them to supply, they've been very friendly and helpful, talk to people in the DOC and the Board of Elections, and the Secretary of State would share obligations uh, for running elections uh, there in Rhode Island. Um, Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., also the Department of Corrections is an NVRA um, agency. Uh, the Board of Elections said, um, of the DOC, they've been great, they've been a phenomenal partner. I've done absentee voting events at the jail. Um, the Board of Elections website actually features monthly reports about new registrations at different locations, and it, this is a like, wonderful document to look at. You can go to the D.C. Board of Elections and click through, and you're looking at tables by month of how many people registered and where they registered. Like, did they register at the Board of Elections? Did they register um, in uh, correctional facilities? It's just listed there on the table of other places that people can register. Um, uh, they have to provide an opportunity to register some great brochures, too, that the Board of Elections puts out about, again, returning citizens, that, that's their language. Um, when I asked about probation and parole, what is probation and parole doing though? This is what, what this attorney at the Board of Elections said. I think that's the biggest piece of misinformation. When they're incarcerated here in DC, they're told with some re regularity that they can vote. Um, we get ballots, so we know what they're hearing. That too means misdemeanors and pretrial detainees, which I'll come back to in a second, by the way. The bigger problem is the general population believing that they can't vote. So on this best practice of making the um, NVRA, making the DOC an NVRA agency, only Rhode Island and DC currently do it, but they do it. It's, it, it appears to be happening, waiting for some numbers. And um, the For the People Act, HR1, which you heard about this morning, um, incorporates this as well. Each state would be required to make the criminal justice agency, I won't read the language, but right, to, uh, to notify individuals leaving supervision um, of their new eligibility. So that's one best practice. A maybe even better best practice, or at least more interesting to me, is um, even states that don't make the NVRA, make the DOC an NVRA agency, um, have the DOC take on the job of ascertaining who's eligible and informing people of their eligibility, um, especially when it's done with a certificate. This is, a, maybe I'm being a romantic, and maybe I'm being naive, I'm sure that I'm being both romantic and naive, and, and naive. but there's a gravity to, adopt, to this idea that the, the state of Wyoming providing you with a document that says, we have determined that you are eligible, is assigned by the commissioner. You can take this to the Board of Elections. We've also informed the Board of Elections of your eligibility. Um, when Iowa Governor Tom Vilsack restored voting rights, um, he did this with a certificate. Of course, it was reversed. Um, it's also happening in Wyoming. In Wyoming, you get the certificate, which they're refusing to give me a blank copy of, but they did share a couple of these letters. Um, they're going to get a freedom of information request without them. <laughs> the Wyoming, again, I want to read this unapologetically because it's so simple and so, to have the DOC do this makes so much sense from a good government. Right? The Wyoming Department of Corrections has reviewed your criminal history and you have met the requirements to have your voting rights restored. Effective date. Notification regarding the restoration of your voting rights will be provided to the county clerk's office in which you were convicted and the Secretary of State's office. A certificate restoring your right to vote will be provided to you in person or mailed to your last known address. A different related letter. Um, uh, the Wyoming Department of Corrections congratulates you on this, on this accomplishment. That's, in my view, the way to do it. To have the DOC, who ha has the best information and has this person in their grip to make this determination about eligibility and to sort of formally uh, provide people with that notification. Um, when I talked to an administrator in the DOC in Wyoming about this, Wyoming has a very restrictive disenfranchisement law. If you have two convictions or a violent conviction, um, you're permanently disqualified. But this recent change makes um, first-time nonviolent offenders, it's a little bit more complicated, of course, uh, eligible. And uh, they had a five-year waiting period for a while, and I asked why she thought they had gotten rid of that. And she said, there was really, this, goes, this is the little shout out to this morning about um, a solution in search of a problem. There was really no evidence as to what it did, the waiting period. 
There was really no evidence as to what it did. And this is like a hard acid DOT, it might be, right? There was really no evidence as to what it did. Look at the other states where, where, that had gotten rid of waiting periods, and it presented a tracking nightmare. That was her language. No surprise. Like, who's done after five years? Like, when did you become eligible? Um, Louisiana is also doing this. Louisiana is also a very, like, the highest incarceration rate state, a very severe incarceration policy, but they have a recent change that the people who have been out for five years or were never sent to prison can become eligible, and a, this is underway, and I don't think we get a copy of this yet either, but a certification being mailed to them. Let me just say a couple things that are happening in New York. So in New York, a parole, um, parolees were recently restored last year by an executive order, and he is, the, the governor's office is now mailing a voting restoration certificate Sorry, a voting restoration pardon to parolees. Um, I want to say just a few things about New York because New York is this fascinating and really messed up sort of place. Here's a little a detail for you, though, in understanding sort of the extended carceral state, the overlap of sort of civil and criminal in the United States. Um, this was a controversial move that Cuomo uh, pulled, and some conservative um, uh, lawmakers were very critical um, of this, and of course went right after, and this, if someone could replace this phrase, like we should all pool our nickels and have an award for like, the phrase sex offenders actually should, we should just like, it should be replaced. Like, that's, it's really sort of that simple. But so the uh, legislators were saying, sex offenders are gonna be restored, we're on parole, and sort of this, this wrinkle emerged where people who were on parole were gonna get their, their rights restored. If they were convicted of sexual offenses, they might have had in their parole conditions that they couldn't go near a school. So the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision had to come up with a workaround where, as I understood this from the Department of Corrections, you had to get the permission, and this is again, this is the shadow carceral state at its best slash worst in the United States. If you were a parolee who was getting your votes, voting rights restored for last year's election in New York, and you were going to vote in a school, you had to have a letter from um, your parole officer and a letter from the school superintendent <laughs> saying that it was okay for you to have your rights. Right, so there's the information cost sort of nightmare sort of experience. New York City probation is organized separately from statewide probation. Um, we do a whole campaign to make sure they know they can vote. I was in a New York City probation office where there was a big poster that I should have stolen. It said, you can vote while on probation um, here in New York. But this raises, and Jen again sort of teased this question, but what are the upstate probation offices doing? If you're on probation in New York City, you're being told that you're eligible. If you're on probation upstate, what is your probation officer telling you? Um, we really don't know that. And finally, voting in jail in New York. And we actually, this hasn't come up today, so I wanted to be sure to mention this. There's a number of places, especially DC and New York, but elsewhere too, and you're gonna mention a lot of registration, where people are going into jails and registering people who were there because of misdemeanors, or who were there pre-trial, or who were there on civil confinement because they didn't pay their child support, which is a lot of people. Hey, you're actually eligible while you're in jail. Would you like to register to vote? So New York has been doing this. I talked to somebody um, at a Bronx reentry facility who would help register other people in Rikers. So a lot of misdemeanors actually in some big city jails are actually getting an opportunity um, to register and to vote. There's a few other states, but my, my time is flying by. So let me just say a couple things, sort of questions that sort of come up and we can talk more about this if you want Q and A or after. Um, but yeah, okay, good, that's good. I thought I was a negative. What do you want? Yeah, not, yeah okay, gracious. Gracious of me. yeah, exactly. So the obvious questions. Like validation, like are these documents being distributed? Like is this actually happening in these different offices? Then so like validation and then variation. Like what are the different parts of the state looking like in terms of these kinds of things? Um, and efficacy, of course. You know, what does it mean to the people who get these documents? Does it make them want to vote if they weren't otherwise inclined to be sort of participating in the system? You know, because I talked to somebody at Bronx Defenders, which some of you know about, an amazing organization in, in, in the Bronx that provides holistic defense. And he was kind of explaining, like, you're dealing with, with people who've had a life in failed institutions. So the schools, like the hospitals, you know, the, the criminal justice system, like they've never had a good experience with any institution. So the idea that you're gonna vote and you're gonna expose yourself to lots of times in, in DMVs or elections offices, or then you even sort of go to vote, right? And there's um, um, uh, Weaver and, and Lerman's research on this on declining political efficacy among uh, people with histories of criminal justice involvement what we need to know about this. But we do, finally, the partisan element of this has come up a lot today, and so I just wanted to say, and this is why I wanted to read the Floridian uh, Republicans quotation as well, but just to repeat sort of what I started, I mean, Alexander Kaysar in his book, The Right to Vote, has this great phrase that people convicted of felonies have negative political leverage. Like, this movement is different from other voting rights movements because it, it hurts you to endorse this group's claims. That is shifting to some degree, but what seems to be emerging now is that you, you can restore formal eligibility to certain people, 
but preserve like complexity and carve-outs. Complexity and carve-outs preserve the diminished status of people with convictions. Does that make sense? Like the carve-outs accentuate like you're still maybe unworthy, and some other people who are like you are definitely unworthy. And we're doing this by our, you have the right to vote by our grace. Right? This is a privilege that we're giving to you and not to the guy next to you. And then complexity keeps the cost of voting high. That's the sort of critical element of this. And again, I'm not necessarily imputing bad faith, although I'm smirking as I'm saying that I'm not imputing bad faith, but that is simply sort of what appears to be happening in a sort of partisan uh, dynamic of this. So thank you, and uh, happy to talk more in the Q&A, and thanks again for inviting me to real honor. Thanks. Misinformation don't necessarily know how to self-classify them according to the legal categories 
the borders are really used um, to using. Then the second part of confusion relates to facts. That is, um, how does it apply to me, right? Of all the stages of post-conviction, but also for legal financial obligations. This is an area in which it's extremely difficult to navigate. And as we see what happened in Florida was we got this great amendment passed, and then now they're in the Florida state legislature trying to muddle it all up, trying to make it really unclear as to how many of your fines and fees you have to pay back before you get your right to vote back. They're hoping to muddle the water at the back end to make sure that, that it becomes extremely confusing and difficult to navigate. And then the final thing is, what do I have to do as a person to get my right back? And when it comes to the clemency process, the pardons process, that can be an extremely difficult and burdensome um, procedure to, um, to overcome. So I'd like to make a couple of analogies to modern voter suppression laws, because I think they really help flesh out some of the problems with confusion in these areas. So for instance, in the ID cases, you get complexity when it comes to which ID do I have to have in order to vote. So in Texas, for instance, yes, um, you can use a license to carry, but no, you can't use a student ID. In Wisconsin, for instance, you can use a military ID, but not a VA ID, even though you would think that some people would go through the procedure of both being in the military and then receiving a VA ID, but only one of them works for the purposes of voting. In Wisconsin, too, if you are in a four-year college, that ID works, but if you are at a technical college, that ID doesn't. But if your four-year college ID is more than two years expired, that doesn't work either. So this just fleshes out the way in which confusion has been used by modern voter suppression tactics that's <coughs> very similar in the felon disenfranchisement context. What the voter ID cases also demonstrate, I think, is how safeguards can be really horrible when they're really confusing. That the, you know, what is supposed to help people end up being way more confusing and damaging, um, damaging than not having them in the first place. So Wisconsin, for instance, is known for having a laxer voter ID law than Texas because you can use some kinds of expired IDs. In Texas, if your voter ID is more than 30 days expired at the time of, you know, at the time of presentation at the polls, you're toast. In Wisconsin, they allow you to use an expired ID, but if you have a tribal ID, it works for however long it's been expired. If you have a driver's license, it can only be eight years expired. But if you have a naturalization certificate, it cannot be more than two years expired. Right? When you have a safeguard that is extremely complex and has lots of different differentiations, it's basically not like having a non-safeguard um, to begin with. The same thing is true when you look at the Texas law when it comes to disability, voters with disabilities. You don't have to satisfy the voter ID requirement, but you have to get a certificate, and a certificate has to be issued from a certain body, otherwise it doesn't count. And that ends up being basically not a safeguard for voters with disabilities. The other thing the voter ID cases, I think, demonstrates is how confusion works in a federalist system. That is, you don't even have to be in one of the really bad states with right. really confusing laws for people to believe that they live in a state that has really confusing laws, right? The problem with voter ID is, now everyone believes that you have to have voter ID in order to vote. I was at a poll, I was at a polling location in New Mexico from the perks of the job. They sent us out to polling locations and we get to do a voter protection on election day. Throughout New Mexico, and I'm there because I'm sick and tired of all the crap that happens in the other states. I wanted to go to a state where things supposedly work well. And yet I'm in New Mexico looking at the line that goes out the door and everyone comes up asking me, do I need to provide an order ID? Would this work? Do I have to bring, you know, like I brought my voter registration card with me. Is that, is that okay? Does it have a photo? Right? New Mexico doesn't have a photo ID law. Like it's completely not required, and yet because, and in part, you know, advocacy groups are educating people about how bad and how horrible right. these voter ID yeah. laws are, and the double-edged sword to all of those efforts are that people then believe that they have these laws that don't necessarily apply in their state. And when it comes to felon disenfranchisement, you can see how this can be a, a problem that mushrooms all over um, the country. I also then want to talk about the differences between voter ID and these other restrictive laws when it compares to felon disenfranchisement. The worst case scenario, if you present something that isn't the proper voter ID in one of these states, is you don't get to vote. Now, my day job is, as a voting rights attorney, we take that seriously and we go to court and we sue over that. But at the end of the day, that is the worst thing that happens to you, is that you don't get to exercise your right to vote. In the felon disenfranchisement context, you are bearing the risk of criminal prosecution, which is the same, which is the whole reason you began the process in the first place. And this relates to what Pippa was talking about when it comes to intimidation. 
right? When they go after people for engaging in something that's really confusing, that reasonable minds really would not be able to tell whether or not someone is eligible, that has an extremely strong intimidation factor, and we've seen that in Texas, we've seen that in North Carolina. The final thing I'll say is we've talked a lot throughout the day about you know, what the purpose of felon disenfranchisement is, and everyone seems to agree that it's only punitive. Confusion over felon disenfranchisement serves no purpose at all. That is, confusion about whether or not the system disenfranchises you doesn't serve any state purpose except for the partisan purpose of deterring the exercise of the right to vote. Right? That is the only thing it does. When people are confused, that only inures to the benefit of the vote suppressor who doesn't want the vote to be exercised and to be used. So what do we do? When it comes to doctrine, we're really in a very tough position. Confusion really isn't taken very seriously in the doctrine. Lawyers bring cases, we love throwing in a flourish about voter confusion, but none of us rest our case ever on this fact. The Supreme Court has cared a little bit about voter confusion, but only in the proximity of time relative to elections. We know about the Purcell principle. Voting rights advocates live by the Purcell principle, right? If you're gonna bring a case, don't bring it really close to election day. Bring it two years in advance so it can get litigated up and down the courts before you get the injunction that you're hoping for, and it's way in advance of election day. So that doesn't really help us when it comes to systematic disenfranchisement, because those have been existent for a long time. The other thing about confusion is it's often litigated on the state's terms. You sometimes hear it talked about in cases where the state gets to justify a voter suppression law on the grounds that it helps mitigate voters uh, of mitigate voter confusion. But for the litigants, we don't get to raise that ever really affirmatively as you know one of the things for us to bring cases. Sometimes it's blended into the burden when we think about Anderson's verdict. But again, nobody's resting their case on the burden piece of this. What I would suggest, and the final thing I'll add is sometimes it can get in very limited situations in the exercise of a court's remedial power. That is, when the court has decided the case and the merits in your favor already, when they're ordering the state to comply with the law, they can say, oh, and by the way, you have to notify people of what you're doing. But that's in a very limited situation when you know, you've already gotten a successful, um, you've gotten a successful verdict. Now, when it comes to doctrinally what to do about confusion, I think we should take mistake law seriously when it comes to criminal law. Right? You've got people who are prosecuted in North Carolina who made reasonable mistakes about whether or not they were eligible. And you've got these statutes that don't at all take into consideration mens rea, which the court is increasingly taking more seriously. And I would contend that we better take mens rea especially seriously in these cases where confusion is not only you know, expected, it's in fact even reasonable depending on uh, the particular state and the circumstances. The final thing I'll talk about is when it comes to policy implementation, which is really the most optimistic part of all and Alec has really already um, alluded to this, is to take a page out of the playbook of the people who started the incarceral state, right? James Q. Wilson said in justifying um, the um, broken windows theory, we need to have certain swift and severe punishments. And I wanna put some emphasis on certainty here because I think that is something that is the proper antidote um, to the problem of confusion that we're seeing. So I'll give an example of Virginia, which is one of the very few states that Alec did not mention, so I'm grateful for that. <laughs> the preservation of my final um, example is, in Virginia, you had an unintended certainty that was implemented by the governor. What the governor first did was say, all right, everyone who's out of prison, parole, probation, you all have the right to vote back. He waved his magic wand and said, I pardon you all. That was challenged in the state courts. The, Virginia State Supreme Court said, no, no, your power to pardon is individualized. You can't just issue a criteria-based order to invisible individuals who you have not named and have not identified. That doesn't work. What then happened was incredible. What happened was he got his staff to literally find a list of everyone who was eligible and write a dear your name letter <laughs> with the seal of the governor's office, dear your name, so-and-so, you have been notified, similar to what happened in Iowa, with the stamp and seal of the governor's office providing much more certainty to people who really need certainty in a situation of immense gray areas. Um, and I think that's the way in which policy implementation can really make a difference um, in rights restoration, is to clearly identify for people when their rights were restored. And I think the other page book, the other book from um, 
the Wilson um, idea is also to coincide it with the time when your rights are restored, so or when you get your right back. So for instance, um, if you look at registration rates for 18-year-olds, a lot of them register really close to when they turn 18, because that's the moment that's significant for them. That's when they have the right. A lot of them then register on election day, but you get these basically two dates that are important for new registrants, either their birthday or most upcoming election. Right? And I would say that for rights restoration, if we can do them either close in time to the elections that they're relevant for, or to the time in which um, folks actually have their rights restored, I think that could make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So thank you. All right, well, I'm going to make it very brief so I can get some, some time for, for questions. Um, listening to all of the presentations, I, I think there are a couple of things that are very clear. One, knowledge is important. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is powerful, right? Both knowledge on behalf of those who actually run the rest restoration framework, the structure, the administrative state, and those who are actually individuals who are going to be have their rights restored, right? Knowing what to do is incredibly important. Um, maybe we should make that part of the law school classes for attorneys. I don't know. Maybe we should do something to make it part of the training for people who actually engage in that process to teach lawyers how to navigate it. Maybe it should be a pro bono clinic. Hmm. There are a lot of things that we can sort of think of as the possibilities to address that lack of knowledge, right? Um, the other piece I thought was a, was a sort of uh, that ran theme through each was costs. This is a costly process, right? Both individual, psychological, financial costs, they vary burden, right? And if you think about individuals who already find themselves the victims of the state or feel themselves that, that they are now coming back out, right? They're already at a disadvantage, they are taking on additional burden and cost, and they already have stigma uh, attached to that. Walking into a polling place not knowing whether or not you were doing something legal or not, if you have just spent time being incarcerated, is probably one of the most damaging and probably fearful experiences you can have. For all of our, our law students who are like, you know, of, you know, filling out your character and fitness, you're like, I have no idea what this means, right? What do they want to know about of my past conduct that may bar me from a you know, clear character and fitness? That same lack of knowledge. For all those undergrads who have to fill out financial aid forms, I have no idea what the hell they're asking. Does it mean? And then that last line that says, I'm signing this on the basis of perjury of a federal, of a federal offense. That is a pretty harrowing experience if you have been convicted, if you are an individual who is sort of walking in this space. The last thing I want to sort of say, the last two things is, is that we are glad that uh, Professor Ewald did not steal that poster, because he would probably be a felon himself <laughs> if he had done that, quite honestly. In illustrious company. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, if he was Steinbrenner and with Debs, he can, they, can, well, they can't hang on together because they're, they're dead. Um, the other piece I think is incredibly important is the humanization aspect of it, right? In law school, we talk about cases, we have names, and we actually don't get to humanize a great deal. This is a human problem, right? And I think the language of this is quite simple. I actually, right now, I call it citizen disenfranchisement because that's what they are. Individuals are citizens, right? We don't label them, we don't give them a particular identifying factor based upon their conduct itself, but based upon taking away, stripping their status. Uh, what I think these three panelists talked about, quite honestly, is We've got these individuals who are now back in our midst. They are not separated from us. They live among us. They are brothers and sisters and mothers and uncles, and yet we have denied them re-entry back into a system of inclusion, right? So I want to thank them for their, uh, for their comments. I'm going to open it up to folks, and no one takes that bite. I'm, of course, going to ask questions myself. That's just sort of who I am. But first, I want to thank our, our panelists sir, for their presentation. <laughs> That's 
That's the person you really trust, who when they tell you you are eligible to vote, you really are in a position to believe them, given that they've just helped you in a legal, um, in a legal context. Um, so I think that's maybe the place to, to intervene much more. I think on the prosecutor side, there isn't trust. I mean, you have authority, but there isn't really trust. Um, so I think it'd be much harder, actually, from the prosecutor side than on the defense side. So, I mean, defense is easier. I mean, practice holistic defense, which is to say that you talk to your client in the 74 seconds that you have with your client. But you, you learn enough about where your client works, what their family situation is, whether they're on benefits, but you familiarize yourself with those laws in your state, which are gonna be different from the neighboring state. And if you can, you talk to your client about how important is it to you to own a firearm, because that, you know, you've got a felony charge, and da, 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 da. You know, how important is it to you? Are, are you in the service, right? Because you could lose that. So, but there are some prosecutors, at least, as part of the progressive prosecutor movement, who do consider collateral consequences generally when making charging decisions. At least that's what they say they do, and whether that trickles down all the way to the individual prosecution decisions, I don't know. Um, but that, yeah, that's basically the answer to that. And so you, you encourage your co yourself and your colleagues to potentially change charges and to take different deals and do diversion or induce suspended sentences to help people avoid. I mean, the felony conviction is not, there's lots of misdemeanors that trigger collateral consequences, but um, to, right, to, to minimize the level of conviction that somebody has in order to diminish the collateral consequences and just to sort of try to share information about what those consequences are in your jurisdiction. Good question. I'll ask one then. Yeah. Um, I actually write about I write about this in the context of sort of not just looking at the right to vote or towards own restoration, but as the, the entire panoply of rights that are lost, right? The entire collateral consequences. And we talk about the restoration framework as being so complex and cumbersome. Um, so my question is fundamentally is is it is it the process, the process is already challenging enough, but if that is not really a primary or top priority, right? If your first priority is is eating, is putting roof over your head then is really the right to vote? Is, is, is our focus so heavily on this an important place initially, given the fact that this is it's a, it's a cyclically ex exercised right, right? It's every two years, every four years, we've got local elections, and yet I have to eat every day. I have to find a place to live every single day, right? And we focus a lot on what I call a, a middle-class luxury right, fundamentally, right? And so is the advocacy properly placed when you're talking to individuals who are disenfranchised that you know need to find a place to eat, a place to work? I completely agree. <laughs> I, mean, I think that people have talked about having a Padilla-like requirement for collateral consequences rather than being voting rights, and I've never been interested in that because the last thing I want is to add to the burden of defense attorneys to advise on things, you know, and immigration consequences are hard enough mm -hmm. um, that I certainly want to add to that place. But yeah, so I'm certainly one of those people who I'm perfectly realistic. which is why we have to make this all the more easy. I mean, otherwise, this is not the kind of thing that people would seek out information about because they're more worried about finding a job, finding a place to live, et cetera. So this is an area in which we really need to help folks. Otherwise, they're not going to seek out this information on their own. And I, I actually think that a lot of the, the same burdens that are, are placed on the restoration regime are also <coughs> placed on the health and welfare and education regime. So if you're thinking about trying to, to get back into society and you're facing those burdens from every single angle, I think that that is something that we do need to spend more time thinking about. And yeah, if I, ha if I have to expend energy to invest in one of these things, it's probably going to be health and welfare because I need to eat and I don't want to get sick. I would just add that there's just, I mean, the, the way to think about this, and someone mentioned this this morning too, but it's just there are different types of harms. And so a, a per, an individual might not feel adversely affected by the inability to vote or to own a firearm for that matter. Um, but there are harms to individual communities and also harms to how we understand citizenship if we're excluding people on this basis. That that's, still makes it worth dealing with. So I want to pursue something that, that Jen was talking about and uh, the administrative you know, problems we have in, in general, felon disenfranchisement and the administration of elections. So elections in the United States are extraordinarily decentralized. So in Missouri, this is the responsibility of county clerks, for example, 
we have 114 counties in Missouri, so you're talking about 114 all sorts of regimes that can cause sorts of problems. I kind of think of that as fixed and exogenous, right? I, I don't think we're going to reform the administrative structure for elections. So it seems to me that if we're going to uh, ease the burden, information costs, and things like that, that's got to occur at the front end before we get to the administrative end. In other words, I don't know that you're going to find, I guess I'm asking for comment, will you find a regime of best practices that you're going to get county clerks to follow, or street, where's the streamlining occur? Because we are so decentralized, and that's just, there's no obvious way to change that. Well, I think one interesting thing that the federal government has done with the state is the sort of paradigmatic approach and this idea of giving money for you to adopt certain standards. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that if you wanted to standardize things across county level, that same sort of idea, which has been successful and not at the federal level, would also work in the state and the local level. So we will give you money if you adopt this particular practice. Um, so I think that that might be one way where we can sort of standardize something as simple as the, the application or whatever. And I know that the federal government has tried to do that with the states. And again, my experience is that. I think one of the problems is the information is so bad. The state doesn't even know who's really eligible, yeah. especially once you take into consideration legal financial obligations. Yeah. I mean, the state has you know databases across various different departments who all hate each other. I mean, you know, don't get along. And there's been you know bitter battles since the beginning of the state's creation. You know, and it's really like if only there was a website where someone could go on and just type in their name and their date of birth and check to see whether they were eligible. I mean. The problem is you get someone who calls the election administration and asks, you know, am I eligible? I'm in this situation. A, they could mistakenly describe their situation. And B, the clerk could completely misinterpret that particular fact pattern and apply it to the law. But if you had some centralized way of knowing who's actually eligible, then you could literally you just do a run a search the same way you run a search on basically a database to see whether you're registered to vote. Something like that would make a huge amount of difference. And that could take away, you know, the discretion of local election administrators who are answering phone calls incorrectly about you know whether people can or not. Yeah, that's why I think was getting to the crux of my question. Before you can solve the problem at the level of street level bureaucrats, you've got to solve the problem at the, the state level because uh, without system information filtering down, you'll still have problems, multiple principal problems, all sorts of things like that, but you've got to solve the problem at the state level first. But it should I mean corrections should be able to do that. I mean, corrections should be the one that can say, like... Corrections can tell you, if you bring LFO into it, it can tell you very that's true. very fast. Yeah, that's but true. even, yeah. even yeah. once you add in, if it's just out of prison, that's right. the easiest one. Because yeah. every layer that happens after that gets very, very complicated. Yeah. I mean, the Wyoming thing is just fascinating, because it's, like, obviously ruby red and, like, super restrictive. Um, and sort of how exactly how it's gotten to this point has got to be a really fascinating part of the story. But, again, like, they have the same thing as everybody else. Like, what's a violent crime? Right, and they're like, all right, here's the list of violent crimes. Were you convicted of it? Yes, no, here's your letter. And again, you, you like pity the county clerk and give them a document with a stamp on it yeah. that they that you know bring this to the county clerk or something. I know. Now you come in. Well, I'll ask one, one final question on that. We're all presuming a negligence on the part of county clerks, right? As opposed to this is not intentional action. I mean, fundamentally, Jim Crow and the, the voting rights era, that was intentional. They knew these folks could vote, and they still said, here, you read the Constitution, and you read, you know, yeah. Little Duck and Rum, right? How do we know that this is not operating today, that we're, we're presuming that it's a lack of information, as opposed to, this is actually intentional obstruction? Well, I mean, I think that that gets back to my incentive thing, right? Like, so I think, I think first, you need to know the rules of the game. Second, you need to know how much discretion they have, and who, to whom they're reporting, and then I think once you once you then understand those things, maybe you can understand how much leeway they have to particularly act on their personal pre preferences, whether they be ideological or otherwise. And and yeah, I think you're right. Final question. I'll just, I'll just have a, kind of one of those comments and kind of questions. <laughs> <laughs> of Personally, course. I've been thinking about uh, this sort of the practical. I'm a really practical, incremental kind of change person. And so you know, how do we make each state better? Access to the franchise. But then I mean, and this kind of really crystallized it for me. But for me, particularly my work makes me think about this sort of larger issue that as long as we are telling people that at some point 
in the process due to a criminal conviction, whether they're incarcerated, whether they're on probation or parole, whether they're done with court processes. If any of those people can't vote, we still have felon disenfranchisement. And the logistics that many of y'all are pointing out in the administration of this is yet another piece of that, right? Like, the, for me, the, 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 the whole system, we need to keep working towards incrementally improving, but the odds of that truly, like there's so many long odds and so many logistical challenges that I think we need to kind of keep our eyes also on the larger prize that like, at least for me, I'm speaking more as an activist than a historian now, like the whole thing's just wrong. Um, <laughs> and you know, we've got to keep that in mind too as we work on these fixes. Any last word? All set. Let's thank the panel once again. Remarks by the EIC of the Missouri Law Review, uh, Lauren. Thank you, Thanks. Um, I'd just like to take a really quick moment um, to wrap things up today and just uh, thank the many, many people who happen to be in this room and that are no longer in this room um, who worked tirelessly to make this event happen today and to make it such a success. Um, so, thanks first and foremost to our panelists. It's easy to say that this symposium would not have been um, as awesome as it was and it just would not have happened without each and every one of you. And we know that you're all very busy people. Um, and so we really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedules uh, to participate in our conversations today. Um, to those of you who travel from afar, we really thank you for your flexibility uh, and participating in the uh, fiasco that was the Columbia Airport. Um, and so uh, thanks for being so willing to work with us and rearrange some of that stuff sort of last minute here. This day also would not have been possible without the collaborations between so many different institutes and departments, um, just to name a couple, uh, the Kinder Institute, the Political Science Department, the History Department, um, the Title IX Office, and the Law School, um, and others that I'm probably omitting in this moment. Um, but we'd like to thank individually each of those departments for their contributions, and it's really great to get the opportunity to host an event um, that encompasses so many interdisciplinary uh, perspectives. Thanks especially to the members of the Symposium Planning Committee, uh, Dean Litton, Dean Mitchell, Jennifer Celine, Jay Dow, Caroline Spaulding, and Sarah Rowan. These folks put a ton of time into making this event what it was today. Um, and it's been a pleasure to work with all of you over the course of the past few months. Um, thanks to all members of the Missouri Law Review for helping to make the symposium come to life. I know that our incoming editorial board is really excited to work with several of the speakers to publish an issue in the upcoming months that is dedicated solely to this felon disenfranchisement issue. And so with all of that said, I will conclude our symposium on felon disenfranchisement for this year. Thank you all again for dedicating your time today. Um, for those of you who are traveling back uh, this afternoon or tonight, safe travels. And then for those of you who are sticking around for the evening, I have been told that Kinder will be hosting a happy hour at Top 10 Wines, I believe. Um, with plenty of drinks and appetizers, and so we would encourage you to uh, check that out as well. Thanks. So I'll just make a very quick announcement about the happy hour. Um, uh, we're going to walk over now, but if you're staying at the Tiger Hotel, this is for people who are staying tonight and the planning committee and anybody who wants to join us. But uh, on 9th Street, downtown Columbia, there's a lovely wine store, wine bar that's a really nice place to kind of unwind after an event like this. I'm going to walk right over, so if people would like to go with me, that's, that's certainly fine. If you want to go back to the hotel and you're staying at the hotel, the directions are really simple. If you walk out the front door of the hotel and turn immediately to the right, you'll run into a street in about 50 feet. Take a left on that street, that will take you to night. As soon as you get to night, take a right and stop and see wine. Um, <laughs> one of the perks of going to the happy hour, if you care to join us, is Jen Celine with a glass of wine in our hand will explain the experiences that she has had in various DMVs and how it is possible that the Missouri DMV has been possibly the best one, but 